to be here and have this opportunity to talk a little bit about the work we're doing at Biosphere 2. And uh, I'm thrilled that I was following Mark's uh, presentation because he covered in incredible detail, far more than I could provide, many of the same kinds of functions and concerns that we'll be addressing in our high fidelity Mars analog. So thank you. And, and also thank you for the organization of those, of those two uh, presentations together. So again, my name is Kai Stotz. I'm a researcher at the University of Arizona Biosphere 2, and we are developing a high fidelity Mars habitat analog. So like many of you, my passion and my inspiration for all that we're doing here started with science fiction. Uh, so Arthur C. Clarke's series, the Rendezvous with Rama series, uh, was very much a part of my childhood, my teenage years. And it's really interesting when you think about the complexity of the, the envisioned spacecraft, those interior spaces that were full cities um, as the astronauts boarded and discovered their functionality, kind of reverse engineering what those things might do you know, as they came to life again. If we look at what we want to do is we become an interplanetary and eventually an interstellar species, many of those things that were discussed in Arthur C. Clarke's books are, are very important to us at a, at a very uh, granular level, as, as Mark described. There's a lot of challenges from medical challenges to psychological to even nutrition and uh, the simplicity or relative simplicity of air and water recycling. So at the Biosphere 2, uh, which has now been 30 years this year, this September was the 30th anniversary, of the, uh, of the closure of the original Biosphere 2 experiment, this is the closest we've come on Earth to simulating what perhaps uh, was, was really described in Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama series, a complete infrastructure, a complete city on, with ecosystems and, and uh, bioregenerative systems for humans to live. And this was a, as, as everyone knows, this was an ambitious project, a phenomenal engineering uh, endeavor with an incredible uh, amount of science that came out of it and continues to come out of this facility as now the world's largest, uh, it's no longer sealed, but indoor ecological experiment. So it has, and, and for those of you who are coming this afternoon, uh, John Adams, the deputy director, and I look forward to giving you the, the, the behind the scenes tour and a lot of details, a lot of good stories about what was happening, what is happening now at the Biosphere 2. So there's a, a full saltwater ocean uh, with uh, a, we're now in the process, the team is now in the process of rebuilding the coral reef, which is really exciting and doing so with distinct species or unique species of coral that we believe will be doing better at the higher, the elevated temperature temperatures of water and the elevated CO2 levels and actually working with real coral reefs uh, off the coast of Florida, if I remember correctly, Florida, Texas, I apologize. There's an, an active, very diverse rainforest, which has over 100 new species of plants that were introduced uh, just in the last couple of years. And the desert biome, uh, which is always undergoing a lot of change, a lot of uh, uh, perturbations in those systems. And this is something that's, that's probably everyone's favorite. This is the lung, uh, which is not invented by the biospherians, was actually uh, had been used in a number of other projects in advance, but it's a 40,000 pound uh, plate of steel and concrete that floats on a cushion of air and it's lifted by a five horsepower motor. Um, and this is uh, very important because it maintains that internal positive pressure in order that you don't have biological contaminants from the outside. And as we know, all the way back to the, to the 1960s with Jane Shoemaker um, and the, uh, you, could, you, you could say that the, the meteor crater in Northern Arizona was in fact an analog uh, for the astronaut training, the Apollo astronauts. And we fast forward to the neutral buoyancy lab uh, at Johnson Space Center and high seas in Hawaii and Nemo and Hera and Mars Desert Research Station, and Lunar Palace, all of these analogs have played and continue to play a part in how we prepare as a species, again, for becoming interplanetary and interstellar in, in the long run. And there's a lot to learn from these analogs. It's not just playing space or pretending we're on Mars. Uh, there's a lot of science endeavors of testing of, of tool use. NASA, as, as Mark alluded, uh, is, is doing a lot of psychological studies because we know the challenges of taking two or four or eight more people and confining them to a very small space for a long period of time really does induce some very real challenges. So a number of these uh, analogs have been used for those. Those in italics, like the LSSIF, NEMO, um, and uh, Lunar Palace One, and, and now SAM, are, are, were or are sealed uh, habitat analogs. That changes everything. That's a completely different uh, game when you're actually closing those loops, the air, water, and food recycling systems. 
So this is uh, from 1987. This is the test module. It was the second prototype for the Biosphere 2. And this is the one that was ultimately used as a model for building the real Biosphere, the full Biosphere 2. So this photograph was taken with uh, the original Biospherians uh, one at a time. A number of them were living inside of the test module. This is about a 400 square foot living space. Um, I think 11,000 cubic feet total, including the lung. There's a miniature lung there to the right. And Linda Lay has the record of living inside for three weeks. She's now a resident of Oracle, Arizona, just up the road from the Biosphere. And Linda and Mark Nelson, a number of the people, we're, we're in contact and working with the original Biospherians. They all say the same thing, which is that within that first day of being inside, they, they gained an intimate relationship with the plants and the ecology of that space. They recognized that every breath they took was it directly related to those plants in that space. And I think that's something that I find fascinating. I'm, ex I'm excited to, to experience that myself when we get this up and running again. So this, this uh, building, this, this test module is now the cornerstone to our revised or our refurbished Mars habitat. So we're starting with that. So starting in January of this year, uh, Trent Tresh and I and John and, and some of the Biosphere staff uh, started working on this is what it looked like. Uh, not exactly a pretty picture. We used jackhammers and shovels and saws and we had to chase out rats. And uh, there was 30 years of plant growth. The desert is prolific at taking over things. Um, and so this was day one. And I have to say it was daunting when we walked up uh, uh, and, and Trent and I actually moved to the biosphere to live on campus, I think I tapped John on the shoulder and said, did I really sign up for this? <laughs> and so we labored uh, anywhere from 12 to 18 hours a day for six months straight, five to, five to six days a week um, at getting this particular building refurbished and operational again. So I wanna share with you just some of the fun photographs. We were grinding and cutting and vacuuming and it was a dirty mess uh, to get this place up and running again, rewiring, uh, cleaning, and uh, sanding and painting and priming and what's and and even I want to talk just one of the one of the aspects of the the science that we're applying to this. Otherwise, it looks like a construction project. But every single step of the way, we checked in with the science reality of what we're trying to accomplish. So we actually ended up coating all the upward facing glass panels with a 100% pure silicone elastomeric. We recognize that as of right now with the technologies we have, we're not gonna have greenhouses above ground on Mars. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and not only that, even if we did, there's probably not enough light. The ambient light fall on Mars is about 50% of a bright day on Earth. Yes, some food cultivars will grow in that. Most food cultivars will require additional lighting. So we did our best to use this existing building and reproduce the light conditions that we might have on Mars. And so we painted all the upward facing panels with a silicone elastomeric, which reduced the optical transmission to about 15% through that. And the vertical glass members, we now have a window tint, which reduces it to 50% optical transmission. So when you're inside, of the test module, which will be our greenhouse space, you are in fact receiving a very similar light fall as you would receive if you were on Mars. And we really took that each step of the way in, in terms of the, we chose uh, paints, for instance, that are, that are low VOC paints, uh, which also means they're not very durable. Um, so we also have two, this was a prototype uh, pressure suit. We have two pressure suits, fully functional pressure suits that can operate from one to four PSI over ambient. These were developed by Smith Aerospace Garments out of Portland, Oregon. Um, and we did our first test uh, back in uh, February with John Adams, the deputy director of Biosphere 2 in a pressure suit. And he did a full one hour walk around, tested tools, climbed ladders to experience the challenges of working in a pressure suit. This is something that science fiction doesn't typically show us. They have skin tight suits or baggy suits, it's not the same. As soon as you put on a proper pressure suit, you are severely limited in your motion, even a well-designed pressure suit. Um, so we have two full pressure suits that, and we'll have more in the future that team members who come to our habitat will be using every time they exit for a proper EVA. We have our first shipping container. Our crew quarters will be attached, hermetically sealed and attached to uh, the greenhouse module. We'll have two shipping containers that will represent or will be our crew living space. We replaced over 3000 pounds of air handlers and heat exchangers uh, within the system that was probably over 200 amps of service with two mini splits uh, for a total of about 25 amps of service. Uh, so there are some things in the last 30 years that have definitely improved in terms of heating and cooling. 
And we, uh, we rebuilt the lung, which was a major endeavor. So lung, again, is the automated pressure regulation system. Uh, for those of you who are coming on the tour, we'll actually demonstrate this. And so this is about a 3,000 pound steel uh, dish that's floating on a cushion of air with one half, one half horsepower motor. And one of, the benefit, one of the things I really enjoyed as, as a manager of this project is the volunteer efforts. Even during COVID, we were able to safely um, and systematically have volunteers come in every two weeks from all over the United States. Uh, even the Mars Desert Research Station sent their associate director and the niece of uh, Sharon Rupert, who's uh, the director of, of Mars Desert Research Station, they came to help us, which was a wonderful camaraderie between two, uh, two analogs. And just another photograph of our last, this is our last volunteer crew uh, just in uh, towards the end of June. So this is how it looks today. And uh, there's a little more grass growing around after all the rain we've had this summer, uh, but it's a vast improvement over how it was just uh, about nine months ago. And then on the last, on the 29th of June, we conducted our first sealed test. We had five people inside for four hours with some basic plant and food cultivars. We had NASA approved Doritos and uh, we played a board game and uh, assembled a robotic farming uh, implement uh, for about four hours. And this is a kind of an area, I climbed up in the space frame and took this photograph. And uh, so this was a lot of fun. And during this very, this is the first time in 30 years this building had been sealed. And so we're very proud of our ability to get it up and running again. Of course, we had uh, three full sets of data monitors. We monitored CO2, oxygen, pressure, humidity, and temperature. And all this data and with a full analysis is on our website. So I won't go into the details here. Um, and this ties in, I just want to briefly mention this. This ties into a project called CMOC. Uh, which was originally funded by Arizona State University, and that's where I got my start uh, in this entire endeavor. Um, so CMOC is a research-grade computer model with an educational web interface, and it's, a, it's hosted by National Geographic at this time, funded by and hosted by National Geographic, is free for all of you to use, and that's cmoc.space, that's S-I-M-O-C.space. It is a really, really amazing project, and we're currently in the process of integrating CMOC into SAM and vice versa, such that we will have a live data feed from all the uh, data capturing devices at SAM, feeding directly into the interface of CMOC, so everyone in the world can log in, either run a simulation, or monitor the real-time data output of SAM. We're also gonna be training a, uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm to ultimately be able to manage the entire life support system, including plant growth of SAM. So just a few closing, uh, closing images. Uh, these are artist rendering, and we have a new version of these coming out, a little more accurate to what we're doing today, artist rendering of the inside and the outside and uh, some of our preliminary um, concepts for the crew space. And the crew space, by the way, is, is really being guided. We have a number of people at NASA who are working with us, including Michelle Rucker and, and uh, Robert Howard, who are working with us to help guide that crew space design to be as close to what NASA would do as possible. Our Mars yard, there's a number of really exciting things we're gonna have in this project. Our Mars yard is over a half acre. We have an indoor space that's a 6,400 square feet that'll have a simulated and scaled uh, Martian crater, an outdoor space that we can reconfigure basically bulldozer and tractors on an ASNI basis for the visiting teams. We have a neutral, buoy neutral buoyancy lab. We discovered in some of the old greenhouses a giant fish aquarium uh, with a plexiglass side. So we're re refurbishing the fish aquarium. It's large enough for three people in, uh, in uh, scuba outfits. So we'll actually be doing scuba training and taking our people in spacesuits underwater. It's small, it's a start, not much mobility, but we're hoping to then raise the funds for a proper NBL. We also have a gravity offset rig that's being co-designed by one of Hollywood's top stuntmen, a personal friend of mine. So we'll be able to simulate uh, various degrees of, uh, of gravity. And uh, the science objectives, quickly, the, the number one is the transition from physiochemical or machine-based to bioregenerative, meaning plant-based life support systems, will be the first analog in the world that I'm aware of to make that transition from an entirely mechanical life support system, air and water recycling, over to a hybrid between that and plants, which we believe will be a long-term solution for long-duration stays off-world. Uh, trans we're going to be working with regolith. Yes, we're going to in induce perchlorates. Study of the microbiome, as Mark alluded to, is very, very important, especially in a space in which people are transi transi transitioning on a regular basis. Use of pressure suits, and as I mentioned, the uh, computer model. So this is a list of the, uh, the construction and operations. I'll actually leave it here 
um, and then move right into the questions. I don't need to read this to you if you guys, you guys can read it. Um, but we're now entering our second phase of construction starting a week from today. So I move back up to the Biosphere 2 for the next six months and Trent comes back from Washington and uh, we'll be receiving volunteers and diving back in. We've got six months to get it done and we'll receive our first teams in uh, probably May of 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any preliminary plans to go beyond 2023 with uh, follow-up studies? Oh, absolutely. I, I apologize. I didn't describe this properly. This is a research platform. We have a five-year plan. We're hoping to be running for 10 or 15 years. So we are building not just something for one study. And those studies that I mentioned in the previous slide are our own interests. This is a research platform for research teams from all over the world to come in. You bring your project to us. We re-review re it. We approve it. We guide it. And so there will be teams coming in from anywhere from five days to several months just like MDRS or high seas or any of the other analogs. So this is not just a platform for us at the University of Arizona. We're building a platform for you. And that includes NASA. Um, and they've already expressed a lot of interest in coming in using the facility. So I apologize I didn't make that clear. Would that also include perhaps eventually um, refurbishing the full Biosphere 2 for such uh, tasks? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> maybe that's a bit more expensive. Um, the Biosphere 2 as a whole was an incredible project, but it also represents what we might do on another planet 200 years from now, 150 years from now. I mean, it's a very ambitious endeavor. Um, I, I, what we're doing is it's much more realistic for you know, 20 years from now, 15, 20 years from now. So there was, there has been talk about sealing the Biosphere 2 up again, but it's in the, you know, several million dollars to do so. Um, yeah, so it's possible, but not on the radar right now. What are the health qualifications for your analog astronauts? Health qualifications. We don't have strict health qualifications. Um, it's a good question in the sense that because we are an analog that's ground-based, although we want to treat it as a sealed system and the teams will have the ability to dial up or down how much of a sealed system they're working in. So they can choose to do a pass through air regulation where there's just constantly air blowing through all the way up to completely sealing it. But at any time, if there's a medical emergency, you walk out the door. We never want to impair someone's life or their health because, because of the mission. That's not what this is about. This is about research. Yes, it's about science, but we're not going to impair somebody's ability to, to maintain their health. They just walk out and they go get help. So, so no internment in the system um, to um, add, add their um, um, body materials back to your uh, simulation? <laughs> no, no. We, 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 we appreciate the carbon addition, but there's probably other ways of getting carbon. One, so, one, yeah. one, of, one of our sponsors, uh, Grant Anderson Paragon, who Kai stats as well, uh, he has a talk which he was not able to give at this conference. Uh, basically, it's uh, for a star, uh, Generation Starships, uh, and the title is What Do We Do With the Bodies? Uh, <laughs> and there's about eight answers to that question, all of which are kind of icky. So. I think Soylent Green had the answer. That, that. That's one of the eight. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that, uh, Kai, I'm going to take moderator privilege, lightning round question. Are you going to grow potatoes like Mark Watt? Are we going to grow potatoes? Everyone asked that. In my, in my longer talks, of course, I start with a picture of Matt Damon growing potatoes. Yes, we will be growing potatoes. Uh, awesome. It turns out the potatoes and sweet potatoes in particular are fantastic at CO2 sequestration, oxygen production. And as we learned from the Biosphere 2, fantastic in their ability to be edible immediately. So if you compare wheat versus sweet potatoes, they're both similar in their CO2, CO2 sequestration per square meter. But wheat, we cannot digest directly. We have to ha harvest it. We have to process it and turn it into something else. It, they say it took seven months to make the first pizza in, the, in Biosphere 2. But with yams and with sweet potatoes, you can eat them directly off the vine. There's a number of different uh, foods that you can make from them. And they're, they're much more satisfying from a caloric standpoint. So. Kai, great job. We appreciate it. Thanks for doing the tour this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.